Let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together today, this chance to look at your word, look at some things that we have overlooked over the years, and uh, learn some different perspectives and um, different order from the stories. Pray that you be with us and guide us as we read and listen and learn. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a review back on last week, a couple of the things. Um, that's one of the nice things. Most of the stuff I've taught over the years has been one or two day things. You just you hammer through hours of stuff with no review. And it, I really enjoy these little half hour, 45 minute segments. I know it seems, you know, we do a lot of review, but for me, I remember more um, when you go back and, and refresh. Oh, that's right, that was that, or, or I didn't catch that last week. So just a little bit quick on uh, God's original plan is we see that symbol of God up on top with the eternal circle and he's reaching out to us, the crown showing that he's over us all. And we were meant to serve, to serve each other. We were created in an, in an attitude of worship, the, the reaching up with our arms, worshiping God. And uh, that was our purpose, service and worship. And we served, or we worshiped, by serving each other. The arrows going back and forth and crisscrossing uh, from us to one another to God and back from God through us to others. And God brought us the law for guidance. And here was the one people. Remember pastor saying last week that he wished that went when he drew this would have included those people in different colors, different races. But the intent is still shown here. It's people throughout the world holding hands, working, worshiping, serving together, worldwide. No division between anybody, uh, nobody one above the other. And then the final at the bottom was the men and women holding hands, supporting each other, working together in service and worshiping together. That was the intent. The overall, that's the way that God had intended. And he set up the order and put it in place. And then we stepped in. Um, the symbol for God has changed up at the top with the hammer, the gavel of justice coming in. Up uh, right in the center there, did that describe? Yeah, it did. The, the sin, where the first thing we did as people was to disobey God. I mean, all we had to do was live in paradise and stay away from one tree, and one tree alone. And uh, it's easy to say, Eve, you blew it, Adam, you let her blow it. it you know, you stepped in and joined them, but. You know, you stop and think, every time I start thinking that way, it's how many times every day do I do that? You know, we, we, even though we know what caused so much stuff, we still keep repeating over and over. This is the point where sin came between us. Um, and one thing I did, I didn't notice this the first couple weeks that we've had this symbol or these symbols up there. But you take a look at this one in number two up on top. You've got Adam and Eve up there. They've got that, that stance, the defiant stance, pastor's favorite teenage stance that he describes it as. And you've got the serpent in between. And on this one, the serpent is actually green. It has that flickering tongue. But as you go through, and as we look at the slides, and, he, and you see those those um, pictures with sin dividing us, he keeps that same symbol. All he did was turn it white and take the tongue off. But that symbol for, for sin coming between us stays the same. 
from the original one where it's painted as a, as a serpent all the way through to where it's no longer the serpent coming between. Um, this is the point where that circle was broken and it turns in on ourselves. It becomes about us, not God. About us, not you. You know, we're, we're now me, me, me. What's in it for me, not what's, what's God want for you? How can I serve you? How can I serve God by serving you? And then murder enters the, the, the scene. The, uh, the dagger with the, with the drop of blood symbolizing the, the murder and the death. And then next, this is that little known story. How many of you, after we talked about this last or pastor described this, how many went and looked up that story of the, of the gods and the, the, other, the other creatures because the gods are coming down and, and having relationship with the humans? Anybody go and, that's one of those that you, I thought about that while he was talking, and I thought about it more and more this week. It's, it's one of those that in Sunday school we never even heard about. And I think the first time that it even kind of came to my mind or, you know, um, I was brought attention to it was there was a movie that came out several years ago called Noah. And I never watched the movie, but I had seen one time when I was flipping through some things, it was on. And here were these giant creatures trying to get on the ark. And it's like, what is this all about? You know, where did they get this? And it, and it was so off from my understanding of the story that I just flipped on without staying and watching it. You know, and then now through, I'm in the Old Testament part of the Diakonia classes. And it runs very parallel to this. And so pastor talked about it here. We talked about it in that class. And that was the end of it. And, and both pastor John and the pastor for Diakonia said, this is a story that nobody understands. And so it kind of gets forgotten. It gets touched on in Genesis, gets touched on a couple more times, but nobody understands it and just kind of goes on, except Hollywood. It was nice to have those big monsters. We remain in that stance. Um, everything just keeps pushing us back. It, it's like the more that happens, the more defiant we come. I'm jumping a slide here. Um, the Tower of Babel, that chance to get closer to God, that chance that, you know, we all strive for that at different times in our life. And as we watch different um, opportunities to study the Bible, and that a lot of us promoted, get closer to God, get closer to God. And here was a point where a group of people wanting to get closer to God, so they're going to build this tower to get to God. And whether we were getting too close to God or not isn't the issue. It's, it's our pride. It's, it's our trying to be strong. It's our trying to get equal with God. God takes and scrambles us. This is the point where he scatters the world. We, we no longer can understand each other. Um, we're set off into different nations. I even think of this today. Look around our different communities and that, the different cultures. How much do we even understand some of the people that live in our own neighborhoods? We, you know, different generations. There's confusion amongst everybody as we go through this. And those, those are the things that had brought, a, brought about those, uh, were brought about by that original sin and brought God's judgment on us. It sets us up for today where we go through and it's the story basically from Adam to Abraham. The first 11 chapters of Genesis laid out here. In, 
in this situation, if you take a look at the top, everything started out good. And if you take a look at that symbol of God, there's that one arrow that has grown coming to us. God is coming real strong to us. And then sin enters the world. I didn't have access to these, so if I jump back and forth as we move on into the new ones, it's because this is the first time I'm seeing the new sets of slides. <laughs> yeah. In that first sin, that Genesis 2 and 3, um, often called the original sin, this is the point where Adam and Eve disobey. The serpent comes between. Basically, the, the, that, that sin, the serpent is the sin, comes between the people, and it comes between the people and God. For this, there's judgment. What's the judgment God has? Death. If you remember back at the beginning, as, you, as we went through those initial, we were intended to be eternal be beings. We were intended to live in peace in the garden for eternity. The first thing that this sin brought to us, the judgment for that, was death. We will now live a certain amount of time. Our life will be finite on this earth. And the next step, God brings grace. He doesn't leave us abandoned. He provides us with clothes. He provides us with food, shelter. He prepares us to move on to that new set of life that we chose. The one thing that I don't think about as much now as I did when we were farming. And, that, and that's one of the things that's I've heard from people, we're, we're drifting away from being an agricultural society, especially in the United States. I know that there's different, different school districts are trying real hard to include classes where the students will learn where their food comes from. Because there's people, on the, and you could get it in Chicago here, they've got no idea where their milk comes from. They don't have an idea of the milk comes from the cow, the beef comes from the cattle, the, the pork comes from this pig. It all comes from the grocery store. Who knows where it comes from? And the Bible was actually written by people that understood and survived off of these agricultural symbols. And so what, what does it mean when they start talking in, in Genesis, part of the punishment is that you're going to have to deal with weeds in, in your fields. People don't grasp that. Pain of childbirth. You know, when, when you're a seven-year-old child sitting in Sunday school and your teacher tells you that all, all you little girls are going to have pain when you have babies, it, it doesn't sink in right away. Even as we age, a lot of these agricultural um, references are losing their effectiveness. And it ties in with something we're going to talk about later with the understanding of these different stories. Is we've got to think about what does this mean? Because even at our ages, we, we start to lose some of those references. The next step was with the sin of murder, which wasn't necessarily murder as much as it was jealousy. You know, one brother gets more recognition than the other. And it ne that wasn't necessarily that that brother was favored more. It was just what they did at that time was more pleasing. We were talking on our way over about two girls, our daughters, stepdaughters, and we had taken them, our, our company had a big um, golf outing and meet and greet and a big social event with, uh, with customers and vendors. And, and we took the girls with us over to the country club the other night. And it's interest, always interesting to get together with teenage girls that you don't spend a lot of time with. And these are twins, twin 16-year-old girls. 
and they couldn't be more different than anybody else. And you can see it in the way they act. You can see it in the way they try and get their attention. And you can see it when one gets attention and the other doesn't. You can see it in the eyes of the other one. And for both of them, when they get the attention, you can almost see a little bit of a look every once in a while of, okay, I'm here and you're not. You know, that, that's a, the thing that comes in there. It's this thing about me, me, me is the sin. Now, in this case, it came through all the way to as far as murder. But it's more this jealousy. It's this that I have to be first. If there again, it's that stance. It's all about me. What was the judgment? Expulsion. Get out of here. You know, you've taken this too far. You're no longer a part of the family. You're gone. And so off he goes. Cain is out, out amongst other people. But God's grace comes through. And he puts a mark on Cain, and he makes it known that even through all this, Cain is to be protected. There isn't to be revenge. There isn't to be retribution. There isn't to be vengeance. Cain is still protected. Even though he's committed this sin and caused this, he is still protected. The third story comes into Noah. That's the, that's the way we know the story. Um, but it's the cosmic confusion. And, and this, is, this is the part where I think our understanding is we don't fully understand. We've never been taught fully, or most of us have never been taught fully, what Noah's story really is all about. And that's this cosmic confusion. And it, and it really starts, like we talked about before, the gods. You know, who are these gods? Who are these beings that are messing things up? And I looked some things up. There's a lot of different theories of what it is. Um, and, and it goes back to, when you go back to Genesis 1, and God quite often talks about we. And he talks about, when he gets to creating humans, he talks about us. And so there's theories about there being multiple gods. There's theories about it being the triune God. There's theories about this being angels. But nobody, nobody knows. But somehow, there is this cosmic confusion. It comes down into, we get these creatures that don't match up within what creation is supposed to be. And this needs to be fixed. This needs to be straightened out. And ultimately, it's all sin. It, it doesn't matter for sure what it is, but it is all sin. And the judgment for this sin is the flood. God is washing the earth clean of all this, and he's saving the chosen. He's saving seed stock. There again, I go back to the, <laughs> it's the agricultural reference, the seed stock. We got, we got this boar and this sow. They're the best the best can be. And so we're going to start the whole pig herd all over again with these two. And so Noah and his family, and then two of each, each animal are saved to start over. And that is God's grace. God's, God's story of Noah isn't all punishment. It isn't all doom and gloom. It's about the grace of giving us the chance to start without this anchor hanging around our neck of what's going on through this cosmic confusion. And so then we go through the story of Noah and uh, God's promise at the end that he will not destroy the earth again this way. And then the fourth story that finishes out the first 11 chapters is the story of Abraham as we know it. Actually, there again, you go back to our 5th, 6th, 7th grade Sunday school classes. This is the story of Babel. This is that, that sin of pride, that sin of striving to be equal to God, that trying to get close to God, that we as, we as humans can climb up to his level. And so we build this great tower, and we're striving to reach him. And 
what was God's judgment? He confused us. He said, that's enough of that. You guys, I leave you all together. I let you sit down and have committee meetings, and you pull this kind of stunt. So he scrambles our languages. He basically breaks us up into different neighborhoods, different communities, different nationalities that don't understand each other. He confuses our language and sends us out all over the place. But God's grace... God's grace comes in, and this is where the covenant with Abraham is actually the grace of this. This is the moving forward. This is the promise for Israel. And this is where this begins. One of the downfalls to this whole thing that we do, there's, not, there's no downfall in the way it's laid out. There's no downfall in God's plans. The, the big downfall in this is the way we learn it the way we teach it. As we go through Sunday school classes, as we go through Bible studies, do we ever study these four as one thing? We never do. We, we study creation and Adam and Eve at one point. And then the next year, the next semester, whatever, then we get into Cain and Abel. Totally different story. A couple years later, we come along with Noah's Ark. And we get a portion of Noah's Ark. And, and I don't know about you, but my remembrance of Noah's Ark started with, we were sinners. And so Noah gathers us all up. And then there's the flood. But the focus of the story was sin and then the rainbow. And everything before that was lost. And, we, and we've totally done that. And then we come along three, four, five la years later. You know, maybe we're six years old, seven years old, we're studying about Noah. And then as teenagers, we jump in and we, we complete the story of the Tower of Babel. First time we heard about it, we were young, we didn't understand what was going on. But there again, I don't know about you, but I don't ever remember the grace of God with Abraham coming in to that story of Babel. I remember that we were going to be great people. We built this tower, and God made it so we couldn't understand each other. Boom, the end, no more of the story. It was done. It was never tied back together. These four need to be put together because if you look at them, they, 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 set the, they set up how everything works. It's, it's a, it's be, I'm totally, word just totally went, but it, it's the way things go, a process. We sin, we're judged, there's grace. Everything God does comes back to caring for us. We screw it up, we're judged, and then we've got the grace that saves us and moves us on. It's a story that we have no problem with in the New Testament. And it seems like whenever we study the New Testament, we'll tie one right to the next, to the next, to the next. We'll jump from book to book to book in one study, tying sin, judgment, grace together. Sometimes just sin and grace we don't talk about judgment in the New Testament ever. We, we tend to leave that out of there because it's not supposed to be there. But we do this. We get to the Old Testament, and instead of having one story that creates that pattern, we've got all these stories that never tie them together. When we started this Old Testament study in Diakonia, each one of us as students, and there's, the group has gotten very small. It was not a big group to begin with. But COVID has really messed it up. And of the group that was from this area down in Joliet, I'm the only one left. And nobody new has started. And I'm actually meeting with a group from up by uh, Rockford. But with Zoom, we can do it. And it works out. And it, it's really the only reason they can keep it going is because you've got these pastors that have to lead this. And you can't have a pastor driving 50 miles 
every week for a study with one person. But one of the things they, they asked about, and, and a common thing as we talked between the leaders and us as students, was the Old Testament, the way we've been taught it and our understanding, doesn't tie together real well. It's not a continuous story. It doesn't seem to, to go just a nice, smooth flow of where things are going, like we're used to with the New Testament. The Gospels, they flow together. Then as you move on beyond them, they all refer back to that foundation we got in the, in the Gospels. And everything goes back and forth so smooth. And the Old Testament doesn't seem to do that. But then we take a look at these four, and it explains. It's not necessarily there's anything wrong with the Old Testament or the scriptures, the way they're written. It's the way we look at them that is the, is the issue. So we need to dig in a little deeper and look at them a little different. My podium is about two feet too narrow. That brings us into the story of Abraham. Here again, we've got, the, we've got the symbol for God up on top. And God is reaching down to Abraham. Here again, here's one of these situations where, at least myself, and as I'm reading what Wendt is saying in here too, we have this picture of Abraham of being this strong, faithful, upright man. This near perfect man that's there. But as you take a look at his illustration, he's still got that teenager stance at. It's me. Yeah, come on. Really? What do you want? Abraham was not that perfect man any more than either of the rest of us are perfect people. Actually, as you go through, Abraham was worshiping other idols. He was worshiping other gods. That's what this little symbol off on the left-hand side, those little gods. In Joshua 24, 2, see if I can get, how many slips of paper? I always wonder why when I pick up a Bible, all kinds of paper falls out. And I remember this morning, cause I got like eight different bookmarks in here. And there's, there's bookmarks, there's pamphlets, there's letters, there's anything I can grab is in there. And I leave them in. So the next time I pick the Bible up, I got junk falling all over the floor. But I had a teacher tell me once that's a good thing. In, jo in uh, Joshua 24.2, And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Tira, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. They were a family that was serving other gods. Um, we had a really interesting slide in Diakonia, and these two idols were in it. But as they dig around, archaeologists are digging around in Israel and throughout that whole region, the whole region that we see as being the center of our Christian, Christian faith, they're finding idols like this. Every household has them. And these two showed up in those slides, these exact, exact two. They're little clay figures, and every household has them as they dig around and find them. Um, idol worship was very big throughout this entire region with these people, but God's grace, he still reaches out to people, and he still uses people for this. Let's see what the next slide looks like. Uh, we'll back up to this one. God makes a covenant with Abraham concerning the nations. And we all know, there again, here's another one of those little stories we never tie back together with anything else. As we've got these old people that have been barren, no children, no heirs, and all of a sudden now God is saying, guess what? You're going to have kids. 
the old joke I remember always came up more in the classes of adults is it, it's not so much that they didn't want children. It's a matter that they waited till they could afford them. Um, but God makes this covenant. And to seal this covenant is the burnt offering. And how many remember that story of the, the offering? There's, I mean, there is an entire farm with the livestock they take. And Abraham has to split all these big animals in half. And they lay them out on the altar. One half on this side, one half on that side. And the, the birds are kept whole. But everything else, lambs, goats, cattle, everything, are split in half. And this was a ritual that was done to seal serious covenants. Is they would, they would have these huge offerings, they would burn them, and the two parties would come together through this. They would pass through this. And the, the meaning was that this is a covenant between you and me. And if either one of us breaks this covenant, this will happen to you. You will be split in half and killed. It was a serious ritual, a serious covenant, um, way of sealing covenants at that time. We, we also see something here in this one that stands out as a pattern of God, and that is the flame moves between the animals on this altar. The flame moves through there. And what do we see as being a common theme as we go through these scriptures, and that is God represents himself through fire. We have the burning bush. We have this story. What, during the Exodus, which we'll get into next week, but how does God lead the people through the wilderness? It's a pillar of fire at night and a column of smoke during the day. God represents himself through this. It's a repeating theme as fire. I got no idea what it means. It's just nice that when you're reading about something and you see something show up with this flame, you know somehow God is involved. Somehow God is there in this at that time. A um, little bit back to our thing of, of uh, Abraham's situation in this. And this, this um, situation God and Abraham is touched on in the New Testament in a verse. And I found this, pastor mentioned it to me when I was with him the other day getting ready for this. Um, and as I looked at things over the last few days, there's many references to this, and that is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8, 9. I even stretched out to 10. I wrote down 10, for, and we'll see when I read it how that ties in. But um, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest anyone boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. There again, he took Abraham, an ordinary man, acting the way everybody did at that time, worshiping other things, living other lifestyles like others did, and he prepared Abraham and Sarah. He molded them, guided them, and worked with them through this covenant. And the plan ultimately was that his family would be huge, which everybody remember how many how many children did Abraham have? Abraham and Sarah. They have one. <laughs> you know, great nation, right? One. <laughs> Two grandchildren. Yeah, right. Big, huge nation. But it grows from there. And it grows. And, and it wasn't actually Abraham and Sarah that got this land. It goes on through the generations. It's a slow process. It isn't instant, the instant gratification that we look for. This is a continual slow process that uh, went on. I, 
I had written down another verse, and I had lost it here. And it explains, there was, there was another step to this covenant that uh, we forget. And in ways, our political leaders forget it. And somebody may remember it when I bring it up. Um, but there, there were strings attached to this. For, for Abraham and Sarah's family, for, for this land, this promised land, for that to remain, for this covenant to remain in place, they needed to remain faithful. They needed to remain faithful to God. And there's even a point in your, in your student book where you read, and it, it actually refers to the land of Canaan, and it talks about Palestine in there. And the thing was that was brought up is, if you stray from God, this land will revert to other people. This is not a permanent set in. It's laid out there for you. It is given to you. It, you are, this is your great nation. As long as you remain faithful. There again, another one of those things that, at least in my background, is not, not stressed. You know, you get that birthday party or you get Christmas and all those great toys come to you. But we all forget that, okay, if we don't clean our room, we lose them. If we don't take care of them, they break. If we lose them, we don't get new ones. You know, here is the thing. This promise, this covenant, including that faith, in, include that faithfulness moving forward for that to remain in place. And the thing was that as, as this land prospered, if they remained faithful and if they served the Lord, this prospering they had within the land would spill out and bless the rest of the nations. Part of it is they would, they would spread throughout. Their, their blessings would spill onto others and would benefit the entire world. There again, that's, that's God's plan. We go back, back up here. We back all the way up to this. Even though we've moved these, through these four parts of the one story, of sin, judgment, grace. At the end of that, at the end of the fourth story, this is still God's plan. God's plan is still that he is the head, he is the, he is the ruler, he is the king, and that we worship. And the way we worship and the, and the way we enjoy is by receiving blessings and sharing them back, serving one another, that is what this is all about. And that we are one world. We're in that complete circle, that tight circle. It's not a broken circle. And maybe, maybe went, left it as all the same color people because that's the way we're supposed to see ourselves. Is not separate races, separate genders. We are supposed to return to this. That was part of that covenant is for God to have this plan carried forward again. We've reached that magical hour of four minutes past when we're supposed to quit. <laughs> so, um, Pastor promised he'd be back next week. So we can take a look again at it. Um, It'll be interesting for me, even as I've looked at it a little deeper this week, to take a look back in between or to hear, you know, as we go through the recap again. Because for me, every week when Pastor does this, the recap we did at the beginning of the last couple, I see him totally different than I did the first time through. And uh, 
as we start moving forward and we get into there again more of these stories that we um, we remember that we've learned and then now we start finding out what the real connection is further on so I don't know if anybody came and made coffee but I'm ready for some <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you